Thanks again, and I won't ask the speakers necessarily to stand up here in, in front of you, but if you, if you do have a question for uh, one of the specific um, speakers tonight, you can just stand up and loudly address them, or, uh, and, and if the question is asked to a specific person and, and one of the other presenters has a comment to make, please, please uh, be uh, forthwith. So, please. Oh, all right. Um, I'll ask a general question and maybe if you would respond to it specifically as you like. But I was struck by the debate and my sense of this is um, the, if the audience were Israel, it, were, it was two men on their knees, you know, in submission to what Israel may think of their opinions, whether it's Iran or Syria. And I wonder if our guests could Give us the backstory. What is going on here? I'll, I'll take a shot at it. <laughs> sure. Um, I, mean, I don't think it's a surprise or a secret to anybody in this country that there's a very powerful pro Israel lobby that is. Um, composed not of the majority of Jewish Americans, but composed of a small, aging, very well-funded coterie of people who speak, who claim to speak in the name of Jewish Americans. But the polling done among the community shows that they, they are unrepresentative. And the pro-Israel lobby also consists massively of Christian Zionists. So you have these two forces in our society that between them have quite a lot of money and quite a lot of numbers, but a huge dedication to this goal of maximizing the support for the most right-wing tendencies in Israeli society. And honestly, I don't think this is a secret or a surprise to anyone. It, it's just that many Americans find it very difficult to talk about it, because once you start talking about it, you have to make the distinction, which is to me a very evident distinction, between criticizing the, the policies of the government of Israel and criticizing the whole Jewish race, you know, if, because they like to say, when I stand up, and as I have for many years, and criticize the policies of the government of Israel, I get called an anti-Semite, which is crazy. I mean, uh, I have so many wonderful Jewish family members, Jewish friends, who are fighting shoulder to shoulder with us. I shouldn't say fighting as a Quaker, but <laughs> struggling with us for peace and justice in the Middle East, including the, my friends from Jewish Voice for Peace, which is a super organization. So, you know, I think we need to be able to talk about that, and we need to be able to talk about the lock that they have on Congress in particular. And they've worked at this, you know, the, the members of the, the lobby, um, both the, the, this kind of coterie of aging Jewish American lobbyists and the Christian Zionists have, have evangelical Zionists. And again, you know, it's not all evangelicals. Um, they've been working at, like, disciplining Congress ever since 1956. 1956 was when Israel, Britain, and France launched a, an aggression against Egypt, including taking Gaza and the whole of Sinai. And President Eisenhower said this is outrageous. It, you know, it, it's a violation of international law, and it, it's against the interests of stability in the region. And he forced the Brits and the French and the Israelis to withdraw. I mean, I know I was like four years old in England, okay? 
okay. But we remembered that. Like he actually pulled the plug on the pound sterling, or threatened to. And he used, in order to get Britain to do what it should, like, I mean, to pull back from a position it should never have adopted. Of course, we've never had that with regard to the Israeli aggression of 1967. No US president has been prepared to, to actually play hardball with the Israelis about the continuation of that occupation of Gaza, the West Bank, and Golan. Two of them Palestinian territories, one a, Syrian, a portion of Syria's territory. So the, these elements of the lobby have, a, have a, a very strong influence over Congress. Actually, I'm going to publish a book next, uh, next year by a, guy, a wonderful guy called M.J. Rosenberg. If you don't follow his blog, you should. Just Google him, M.J. Rosenberg. Um, and he, he used to work for the lobby, and so he's going to be, it's going to be like a tell-all, um, spilling the beans about how the lobby works. And then he went to work for Senator Carl Levin, so he knows exactly, like, from both ends, from being a part of the lobby and then from receiving the lobby. Um, precious. It'll be a fabulous book. Um, so they also have a lot of um, influence on presidents and presidential candidates. And, you know... These are, it needs to be said again and again that this current government in Israel is extremely right-wing, extremely racist, extremely expansionist, and they're going for an election in, in January. If anything, the Israeli political system is going to move further to the right at that point. Um, so what do we do about it? Well, of course, these um, pro-Israeli forces in society have also been extremely important in pushing American policy toward the whole of the rest of the region, Iran. If you go to the website of APAC, which is the, the chief pro-Israel lobby, for the past, I don't know, 10 years, the, the website has been just dominated by, you know, we've got to do this against Iran, we've got to do that against Iran, and they push all this legislation through, which, which boxes in what the administration can do. Um, the war against Iraq. I think there is plenty of evidence that the, um, the pro-Israel lobby was behind that. As were other forces in society, but they were very significant. Um, with regard to Syria, it's kind of interesting because I think they, they've... It, you can see portions of the lobby have been very eager to raise the, the uh, heat on Syria. You know, I hate, to be, I hate to give people bad motives, but they love it when Muslims kill Muslims. I mean, they just love it, you know, when Iraqis and Iranians kill each other for, for, for 10 years. Um, and the idea that, you know, you could have Muslims killing Muslims in Syria is something that there are a lot of people, and you know, you can read this even on foreignpolicy.com website. People say, well, you know, if, if the Syrian, Syrians of different varieties, Muslims, Arabs, kill each other for the next 10 years, it's not the worst thing for Israel. So how do we counter that? We need to counter that very carefully and with great dedication by pointing out, number one, that to criticize the policies of the Israeli government is not the same as being anti-Semitic. Number two, to stand up for human equality, that it is like the human right of every single Palestinian or Syrian is just as important as the human right of an Israeli, of a Jewish Israeli. And just to, to kind of keep educating ourselves about all these things and try and restore some balance to our government. I mean, what I'm afraid of is that Netanyahu has been playing a very cynical and dangerous game with regard to Iran. I think that he doesn't actually want to see war against Iran, either to launch it himself by Israel, which would be suicidal, or to see the U.S. join or lead 
an attack against Iran. But I think that he and all his backers in this country, including this Sheldon Adelson and other nefarious forces, have been very eager to stir the pot about Iran and to make that like headlines all over the place precisely in order to distract the American public from what's happening in Palestine, where the Netanyahu government has been paving over the whole of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and making it all into one large extended is network of Israeli settlements with little prison camps here in this Palestinian town or there in that Palestinian town. I mean, I go there quite frequently. It breaks my heart to see my friends in Bethlehem encircled by this wall and with the wall getting tighter every year and the restrictions. I've got friends in Bethlehem who for 30 years now have not been able to go and visit their family members who live four miles down the road in Jerusalem. I mean, that's how bad it is. So, you know, we don't learn about this in this country very much because the mainstream media has all been, you know, flapping around about Iran. I think it's just been a major distraction. But of course it also runs the risk of developing a momentum of its own. Sorry for going on so long. If I could just add briefly, I was in Chicago last night at a debate of the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, I guess, party candidates for president of the United States. Uh, there were two gentlemen invited who declined the invitation. And at this debate, you had the, the Green Party candidate, Jill Stein, the the brand new Justice Party candidate, Rocky Anderson. Uh, these are both two people that I know and, and like. And uh, the Libertarian Party candidate, Gary Johnson, and then our former uh, congressional misrepresentative, uh, Virgil Goode, who is the, the Constitution Party candidate, whatever that is. And across the board, you had universal, passionate, enthusiastic, uncensored agreement among these four candidates, some of whom want to treat a living wage and health care and housing and higher education as human rights and, and fund these things with the money that is more than available in the pockets of Mr. Adelson and, and gang in this uh, country that's concentrated the wealth to such a degree, and some of whom, like Gary Johnson and to some extent Virgil Goode, want to eliminate education and housing and, and so forth, and taxes, and just do away with everything. Uh, across the board, across this wide range of political opinion, every single one of these candidates got up and said, we need to not attack Iran. We need to end these wars, we need to close these bases, we need to bring these troops home, we need massive cuts in military spending, we need to re Virgil Good was the least specific as to how much he would cut the military spending. And I, of course, in my coverage, I was there for Al Jazeera, I mentioned the fact that we struggled to get him to stop funding wars, and he never would. But he claimed to want to cut military spending. Uh, and Gary Johnson wants to cut it 43%, uh, and Stein and Anderson want to cut it 50%. Uh, but they, every single one of them, want to abolish the Patriot Act, restore the right not to be spied on or assassinated or imprisoned, and end the militarism. And, uh, and you, you see this among candidates that are representing the vast majority of the U.S. public, but not in those debates where two parties have gotten together and secretly negotiated a contract for a debate that excludes tough questions and follow-ups and bars any other candidates than those two and is sponsored by a bunch of corporations and Anheuser-Busch and, and, and aired on our corporate media. Uh, so there is a potential in this country for uh, an activist movement across a, a broad range of political opinion uh, that says no to this war agenda and even to subservience to Israel. Rocky Anderson in every public comment is, as, as you asked in your question, he's rhetorically asking how in the world 
can a U.S. president swear to, uh, to go and ask the Prime Minister of Israel what he should do? It's outrageous. Uh, and, and, and so there was a, an independent journalist after this debate last night who went up to each of the candidates and asked them about Palestine because, of course, it hadn't come up. Uh, and Gary Johnson apparently had never heard of Palestine, but, but, Rocky, <laughs> but Rocky Anderson and Jill Stein were absolutely excellent on that question. And so there, there is the possibility for greater wisdom uh, and uh, restraint in this country than what you would think from watching uh, NBC and CBS. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a question of that, but uh, I have some misconception and propaganda today, unfortunately, about the Syrian revolution. I'd like to correct a little bit, especially for Helena. I don't know where you're getting your information from, but for six months, the revolution was extremely peaceful. And he was killing a hundred a day. A hundred a day at least. Peaceful, without fighting. Where is the war in that? Nobody, who is going to come and tell them after that, oh, you can't get violence because he's only killing 100. It's okay, stay more consistent after that. There's a lot of propaganda coming. I don't know why. Second point, how many, all what I get from the, from the media out there, from a lot of places that, oh, it's jihad is coming out, jihad is there. Jihad is about 1,500, just like Roy said. Maybe a little bit less, but a little more. At least number of fighters is 60 to 80,000. Where is the rest? They're not jihadists, so what they're doing? They're not the extremists. So what about them? So when they become demonized, them, oh, it's Al Qaeda, and this is this, this. This is something missing there. You have to ask yourself a question. What's missing? Why so fiercely a force to say the Syrian certain revolution was extremely resistant, resilient, and stayed peaceful for a long time, more than any other revolution? You compare to Egypt and South Africa, was Egypt for two, ten days. And he killed 800 something people. This guy killed 100 every day, so it's like a week's war for him to kill 800. So who am I on you to come in and say, oh, you're not peaceful, so I'm not going to do anything for you. <laughs> South Africa, I don't know if any country, South Africa or not, who they bomb their cities with airplanes and tanks and all, whatever weapons they have, and everybody's looking at it's okay, you're not the one I like you, so I don't mind if he kills you. Unless you can use chemical weapons, I'm not going to interfere. What is that? There's something missing. Fact, another fact I'd like to remind you with. Dictators use minorities all the time to their advantage. And what the regime in Syria did is use the churches to his advantage, for his propaganda and to scare them so they don't join the opposition. And they, frankly, they fell into that trap. He put a Christian defense minister to do the killing for him. So they have become dirty and bloody, so they become attacked to him. Recently, unfortunately, they started to stray away from him. Good, good, good job, but it took a while. They scared them, by, oh, this is extreme, then I can kill you, come with me. That's an old tactics, we should not fall for that. South Africa didn't kill as many people. As Assad did. So he can say, oh, come on, unless you sit with him and negotiate with him, we'll not go. He needs to go. And he will go. Whether we accept it or not, we're going to be on the right side of history or not. Whether he kill the whole country and destroy it, and then he will go, or we will participate in it. We don't want war. I don't want war. We will participate for peace. It's simple. Don't give him weapons. Put him back so he doesn't get money from Iraq and all those countries who are puppets for our regime. Back tight. Sanctioned around him so that he doesn't work for or money, and then he will collapse. If, if other people want to get weapons, then they get weapons. You don't have to give them. I don't have to give them. They can give it themselves. I'm not going to stop them if they want to fight for themselves. Just basic fairness. People don't have to be slaughtered and they say, oh, you're not good. You're jihadis. You're this. You're that. So it's okay. Go kill them. That's too much propaganda. That's all I can say. Someone, I want to reply, but someone else want to turn? I appreciate your comments, Hisham. The structure of my eight points was to say that even though there are significant interests that want to change and want to find resolution, those interests are blocked um, either by themselves or other national, regional, or international or local forces. And the double binds in Syria are not easily broken. In 1922, the French general who won the Battle of Maysaloon 
which is now in Lebanon, proceeded on the way into Damascus and knocked on uh, Salah al-Din al-Ayubi, the um, Muslim general who kicked out the crusaders, knocked on his tomb in Damascus and said, Salah al-Din al-Ayubi, we have returned. If United States forces or European forces or NATO forces would go into um, Syria now, the, the crusader legacy would be triggered, or wouldn't it? Um, there, there are multiple factors. I, in my six years in Syria, I was very aware that in the tens, if not hundreds of people were killed, even then every month, in prisons or, or in other forms of severe torture by this regime, which was, which was acting this way before. The challenge for me is if you open up open conflict, what will prevent it from becoming like the Balkans? What will, what will prevent, it is an open conflict now, there's an open civil war. But almost at every level, there are divisions that lock a positive movement forward. Right now, Qatar and Saudi Arabia are funding different groups because they cannot agree among themselves as Sunni uh, funders of the opposition what the nature of the groups they will fund together will be. They can't even cooperate with each other. And Turks and Americans, they're starting to figure out what's possible, what's happening. I mean, you can go online and read articles about Ambassador Stevens, who was killed in Benghazi, as having known or potentially participated in, with the folks in Libya who were smuggling weapons from Libya into, into Syria. There are multiple levels at which there is assistance behind the scenes and criticism of that assistance by other powers that the whole structure of the conflict in Syria is locked up at multiple levels where Russia and China are resisting. Yes, the United States provided the intelligence for the Turks to bring down the Syrian airliner that was bringing some weaponry from, from Moscow, but that was one move which the Russians would find a way around. So that the challenge of, of your critique is there is no, currently no reasonable, nonviolent, way forward to resolve that conflict because it's continually blocked by another interest or party. I don't want to sound fatalistic, but Helen? I, I actually disagree with Roy somewhat. Um, and Hisham, I mean, I hear the hurt in your voice, and wars always bring a world of hurt. I mean, and there are more than 500,000 Palestinians stateless Palestinian refugees in Syria. It is worth remembering that. And that in a time of civil conflict, stateless people suffer the worst. They get ground between the fighting parties. And the situation of the Palestinian refugees in Syria is extremely difficult. However, I think You've been exaggerating a little bit, Hisham. You're, you're saying that you know there's been a hundred. There back then in 2011, there were 100 killed every day. There were not 100 being killed every day. I mean, I hate to get into it, but it's kind of important not to exaggerate casualty figures right now, because casualty figures are used like a bloody shirt to whip up tensions and get us to support war, which they did. I mean, like in Libya, we were told that unless NATO bombed, there were going to be 10,000 casualties in Benghazi, which was nonsense. There was an African Union mediation mission underway at the time. They had to pull out because NATO wouldn't give them assurance that they wouldn't bomb them. In this case, in the case of Syria, right now, the, the highest figures we hear are that there have been 30,000 killed. I tend to think that it's probably between 25,000 and 30. It's impossible to know exactly, but on a daily basis, 30,000 over 18 months does not work out at 100 a day. So, you know, let's not exaggerate the casualty figures, because exaggerating the casualty figures raises tensions and makes it harder to resolve issues. Now, where I disagree with Roy is basically your pessimism, Roy. I mean, I, I think your analysis of the four interlocking levels and how they are all locked and the traumas that everybody carries around, you know, when there's conflict, everybody acts out of a sense of 
trauma and self-righteousness and lack of empathy and lack of, you know, normal human reasoning often because conflict raises passions to such an extent. But I think in the case of Syria that the interlock between these different levels can also be used in a, in a positive way. It's not just a negative blocking thing. And particularly at the international community level, you say, for example, that Russia and China resisted. What did they resist? They resisted a NATO initiative. You could much more usefully say that our government resisted the Kofi Annan process because Kofi Annan insisted that the, the negotiation should involve representatives of the regime. So I think if you're talking about who's been blocking diplomacy, it's our government that's been blocking diplomacy. It's not Russia and China. Um, but I think there is a potential for negotiations to be put forward by the international community and hopefully also take ground at the regional level. Remember, Erdogan, the Prime Minister of Turkey, does not want to go to war. There are forces in Turkey who want him to go to war, but it's a minority in Turkey that wants war. That land border that they have with Syria is Turkey's weighs the longest land border. It's 530 miles long, and it's mountainous. It's very porous. Turkey cannot control that border. And, and they've had this eruption of things happening in the Kurdish areas of Turkey, and also real problems politically with the Alawis and the Al Alevis in, in Turkey. They don't want to go to war. So, you know, <coughs> Erdogan has been to visit Tehran to try to get a Turkish-Iranian process. The new Egyptian president is potentially part of that and could maybe bring the Saudis and, and Qataris in. I mean, there are things, there is some wiggle room. And I think the fact that Lakhdar Ali Brahimi is the special negotiator, the special representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations right now, is very hopeful because Lakhdar, remember, is an Algerian. He knows from his family in Algeria what the cost of 10 years of civil conflict are for everybody who's involved. I mean, the way that I look at it, People should understand, you know, you can try for a negotiation now. It's not going to be easy. There are going to be passions, there are going to be disappointments, there are going to be people feeling betrayed. A lot of arms salesmen might miss out on their profits, etc., etc. Or you can keep this conflict going for another 10 years, as happened between Iran and Iraq, as happened in the Algerian Civil War. And at the end of the day, there will still be a negotiation because one side is not going to beat the other. So if it's going to be a negotiation, let's do it now. Let's not have the 10 years of continued conflict. That's not necessarily true. How do you know it's going to last 10 years? How do you know? Without weapons, with minor weapons, in a year and a half, it's almost collapsed. If it wasn't for the support from international Iran, it wouldn't be to war. In fact, within maybe half a year he'll be gone. I haven't heard a single estimate that says he's going to be a little more than the end of the year. He's going to be away for a few months. Yeah, and last year, at this time last year, everybody was saying he'll no. be out by the end of 2011. No, okay, so I don't have a question. With due respect, Hisham, I... I I appreciate your concerns. I, I think that the demand ought to be that the people of Syria must be better off, not that he must be gone. Right? This elimination of the evil dictator, the single individual who embodies all of the targets of our hatred that is such a powerful tool of propaganda for war, which we, we see every time for periods of years leading up to, to U.S. wars. We hear, hear the, the plural used to describe our government's behaviors and the singular he used to embody an entire foreign government and its people in an individual and the moral demand becomes he must go. Even if the people of that nation are worse off, even if we risk an escalated regional war, that he is gone sometimes sat is somehow satisfies our visceral 
demand to lash out, even if that lashing out at that hated individual makes the people we supposedly care about worse off. Which, if you look at Libya, yes, we were lied into Libya. They misused the United Nations to get into Libya. But large numbers of people were killed by NATO in that process. And Libya is not better off. And Libya is not a, a nice place to live now. Uh, I, uh, my concern with groups like Amnesty International, that I know you work with Hisham and that I have a lot of respect and appreciation for a lot of times, is that this support for war that they've, you know, when we were protesting NATO in Chicago this summer, Amnesty International had these big, huge advertisements on the streets for everybody to see thanking NATO for its war in Afghanistan that was benefiting the women of Afghanistan which is not what women told me when I went to Afghanistan. Because bombing women is also something unpleasant toward women. And, and so this, the, the, I do not think that Amnesty International and many other groups, not to single out that one, would be acting the way they're acting toward potential and actual so-called humanitarian wars if our president were not this Nobel Peace Laureate who went over to the Middle East and said things like mutual respect. I mean, I was glad to hear that people appreciated hearing about mutual respect. I think it's outrageous to condemn him for an apology tour and so forth. But if we were to actually respect Iran, we wouldn't be flying drones over it, assassinating its scientists, imposing murderous sanctions, sponsoring terrorism. I mean, we have to, at some point, drop our infatuation with individuals, the good ones on our team and the evil ones on the other team, and look at actual facts and actual behavior and actually work toward, toward a behavior that reflects the nice rhetoric, uh, the mutual respect. Yes, number one, I never saw any amnesty support war here. I, you show me something I like to see. I never support for Afghanistan or Syria. Well, you should have come to Chicago no, last I don't summer. I don't need to go to Chicago. Show me it on the website. Look at the chat. They have complications. Show it to me. Number one, number two, I'm speaking for myself right now. I never ask just for an individual to go or not. I'm asking for peace. People need to have their way. And the will of the people, clearly, that he needs to go and they have their own dependent thing. Whatever it is. I'm not going to tell them, oh, you have to be this or that. But the clearly of the will of the people is for him and his regime. All of them. Not only one. Just change one and everybody will be happy. And the regime, so people have their own will. And they can have a process to move on and have their own dependent by what it is they want. That's what we do. And the people who support the regime? I'm sorry? And the people who support the regime, what do you have to say for them? Well, you have to reconcile, but you have to live, you know? You have to find a way to live. Everybody can say they have pro and against. You can't just say, oh, somebody support this, so I'm going to stop it because somebody is more there. That's normal issue. It's very clear. Right now, to see in Syria, where other countries, there are two regimes, people hate it. And they need to go, so people can live in peace. What's happening in Libya and other countries, they change a few people on the top and the regime is still there. The corruption is still there, the, all the bad is still there. So if you want to continue the revolution, continue what it is, let people have their own way. Just, just real quick, I think we should move on to another question. Um, just, I, I agree with Helen's critique of my very brief <laughs> what I was presenting. Um, my challenge is that all, at all four of those levels, what informs my pessimism is there's not enough overlap in, in a encounter between the two sides at any of those levels to have a productive conversation that moves the conflict forward. For example, um, I, I'm not calling for international military invention in Syria. I respect Russia and China for saying, no, you're not going to do in Syria what you did in Libya. Um, I, I agree with that because Libya is now mess of fiefdoms and warlords and there was no peace building process as a part of the transition of the power. There was no gradual gradual and incremental shift in the power structures like there was in South Africa. When you when you decapitate a regime, you do not allow the, pro, the transformation of the structures and power centers that are needed. Even at the country level, one thing I didn't read that I prepared, but what, in relation to your question, Hisham, what may be emerging in some countries experiencing the Arab Spring, read this, hear this in relation to Syria, is only the first phase of regime change that is the unmasking of the real powers behind various dictators who functioned as figureheads. 
in Syria it is becoming more evident that the control of the country and the political process is not in the hands of Assad alone, but is also held more independently than imagined by various princes around him, who were leaders when he came to power as a 34-year-old. And when Kofi Annan came to Syria, Idlib itself was attacked by one of these forces as an independent action that Assad probably didn't approve to embarrass Assad in front of Kofi Annan. So what you're dealing with is various powers sabotaging each other at each of those four levels in a way that I don't want to be pessimistic, but there's not enough interaction between both sides of those four levels to have a process that moves positively forward. That, that's my main thesis. So this gentleman and then Rick had a question. <coughs> On the subject of Iran, <laughs> the, I believe that Ahmadinejad's uh, term is nearing its end, and that we're they're moving into a. Can he succeed himself? No. So there's going to be a transition. What are the forces at work in Iran, and what are their positions? And with a non-presidential election here next year. Will there be possibilities for some rapprochement? I'll say just a few quick things on that. Please. Um, it's a great question. Great question. Um, to what extent does our behavior on the outside help or hurt? More often than not, we've been messing things up, making it more difficult. However, I will say this. My, my understanding of what happened in the Iran's presidential elections in 2009 was that, again, Obama's comments touched off an extraordinary debate inside Iran. Previously, the one taboo was you don't talk about improving relations with the United States without the approval of the leader. Khamenei himself, when he was president in 1989, got slapped down by Khomeini for pushing it a little bit further than Khomeini was ready to hear at the time. But it, it is a subject that the Iranians of all stripes are listening to, they're concerned about. They would prefer to have better relations with the United States. And yes, it will shape the next presidential debate inside Iran. However, the problem is, since the disputed elections inside Iran, right now the space for open debate on these issues is really constrained. What I have found interesting is, as I'm following it in, inside Iran, I know these are really delicate subjects, is that there's an increasing divide among the, the competition that's still permitted and still actively going on, there's new fault lines emerging. People had been assuming that Khamenei, the leader, had somehow, that her, somehow had been a coup against him by the Revolutionary Guards, or that there was new pressure centers against it, that somehow Khamenei had taken over the system. I've not seen the evidence for that. I'm far more persuaded that the leader still very much remains the leader. And ultimately, his word does still matter. And I've been picking up a lot of signals that Ahmadinejad's, if you will, his stature inside Iran is greatly diminished from where it was. Now, for us to sit there on the outside and crow about that's not the way to go. But whoever the, uh, the American administration is in come January, the ultimate address for resolving the situation isn't the president. It's going to be the leader of the office, the Supreme National Security Council, which will, yes, include the president. But I'm with you, though, in that what's happening inside Iran, th there's, there's the potential that because of the disappointment and the, the tremendous angst inside Iran after what happened in 2009, the system, a severe set of, shall we say, setbacks, there may not be as much enthusiasm for the next election as there had been in 2009. There is a huge debate among the reformists and the Green Wave and other movements. Why do we risk participating again if we're just going to get crushed as a result? So the, the leader himself knows he's got a major legitimacy problem for the system itself. Right. Just even a even conjecture about appointing the next president, not even having an election. You want to say something about that? I, I, I can't see it going that far. I understand why. But, but see, the, the Iranian Revolution had three great goals. Independence for the country, Islamic Republic of Iran, the pride of the nation, Islamic, a nation in the name of Islam, but also a republic. And what the whole dispute in 2009 was that the system hadn't lived up to its republic credentials. This was not, as some of my students are here, it was, it was not a revolution of, uh, 2009 was not about overthrowing the system, it was an argument about how do we get the system to live up to its own ideals. And that still is the core fault lines inside the system. And if they would suddenly do away with the presidential elections, or perhaps amend the Constitution so we go back to having a prime minister, which they don't currently, they have changed the Constitution before, that might happen, but uh, it would be extremely delicate inside the system. David. 
Well, I just wanted to add one word about this idea of diplomacy as the solution with Iran, because I, I very much appreciated all of your rebuttals to the usual objections to diplomacy. I have a different sort of objection to the idea of diplomacy, which is that there is not a crisis to be resolved. That when the, the platform of the Democratic Party in the United States of America says that if Iran does not stop violating the non-proliferation treaty, we will have military action on Iran, and there is no evidence that Iran is violating the non-proliferation treaty, right? That we're asking Iran to prove a negative, to do the impossible, to stop engaging in a behavior that our own government tells us Iran is not engaging in, just as we asked, demanded that Iraq produce the weapons it didn't have, right? And then the, the choice becomes, do we resolve this bogus dispute through diplomacy or arms, right? These are not the options, so we need to talk with Iran. But we don't need to talk with Iran about that demand, because it's not a legitimate demand. Right? We need to stop making that demand. We need to stop threatening Iran, which is actually something that can be done just in Washington, D.C. We, we can just do it. Change right? order, yeah. We can cease threatening war on Iran. Cease pretending that Iran is developing weapons. We have no information it's developing. Then proceed to join with Iran and the non-aligned nations of the world to move toward a nuclear-free Middle East, which of, uh, of course requires going up against the lobby described by Helena, because there is a nation that does have nuclear weapons in the Middle East. Actually, too, because we have them there as well. Yes, we have them yes, there. Yes, there is. <laughs> all around yes. Iran. Right, right. And, and I would just add one thing. Some of you may be familiar with the grand bargain that then-President Khatami offered in 2003, which would have addressed a whole series of issues that we had with Iran and would have addressed a whole series of concerns that they have, beginning with, you know, recognizing our revolution, not supporting various opposition groups or terrorist groups on the margins, a series of concerns. In, and also, even Israel-Palestine was on the table in that grand bargain. If we don't have diplomacy, there's a lot of real, real things that we should be talking about. But the, you know, if, in the language of international politics, there's a lot of common interests, common concerns between Iran and the United States, beginning with Afghanistan. I mean, there's great fear that Afghanistan is falling apart, it's going the wrong way, concerns about Pakistan, concerns about Syria too. Why not get involved, Iran involved in helping to resolve the hell in Syria, to link our two subjects to tonight. And you, you, yeah, so I, I would your 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 point is well taken. And let's have diplomacy about real things, and there's a lot of things to talk about. Uh, I think we might just, just kind of do one last comment. Well, Kofi Annan was on the Rachel Lando show, and he was saying a very perceptive thing. When you hear people speak, whether they're United States politicians or Iranian politicians, you have to say, to whom are they speaking? Because what they say has different content and will have different results. So you don't take it immediately at face value, but you think about what they have to say for their own constituencies. So you have to take all that into consideration. So the possibilities could be there. And that was part of the reason I was bringing up commenting recently, talking to his own people about the, the model of Imam Hassan, the ideal of, of diplomacy and working out conflicts that it's okay and it's quite Islamic to do that, even if it means compromising what might have been previously seemed to be sacred, unbendable principles or issues. The big one being. One last question, Rick. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, you know, I had the good fortune to, to spend a little bit of time in Syria around 2006, 2007. And I mean, I'm not an expert. I wasn't doing anything before. I was hanging out. Um, and it was awesome. I mean, it's an amazing place. But something that people there knew, that people here don't know, but it's very common, and I had a lot of conversations with just kind of average folks, you know, um, that, you know, like, of course, they're very quiet conversations because the secret police are indeed pretty much everywhere. But, you know, they were talking about George W. Bush, and they were talking about Bashar al-Assad, and what they constantly would say, I heard this again and again, it's like, let's not pretend they're any different. You know, and the other thing is, let's not pretend that your country and my country are actually enemies. Because it's bullshit. And everybody can make that big, you know, like puff up their chests and like, like you know, spew out a lot of rhetoric, but it's like, we were really happy to be friends with Syria when we wanted to send people places to be tortured. And the Syrians were very happy to do that, or the uh, Assad regime, they were very happy to do that for us. 
And so, like, Obama and Hillary Clinton and all these people can stand up and they can say, the Assad regime has to go. But I just think there's so much more to it than that. I, I think that it's like, it's a convenient political position to take, but I think that there's a lot of other kind of irons in the fire. And I think it's a mess. I mean, ultimately, that is like the thing about it, just a mess. Well, I, I think it's an excellent point that when we talk about these so-called interventions, at most what we're talking about is flipping sides. We're not going to support Gaddafi anymore. We're not going to support Mubarak once he's gone. We're, you know, we're going to turn against our former partners in torture uh, because it's now to the advantage of our government, which does not care a damn about human rights or humanitarian abuses, to turn. Not that there aren't low-level people by the hundreds in our government in Washington who care about human rights. Of course there are. But it's not what makes the decisions uh, in war and peace. Uh, It's not. And Obama, I mean, I have to say that it's just like throughout the entire Arab Spring, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Somebody might have been paying more attention, but I feel like he came out every single time on the side of the dictator and then said, wait a minute, Ben Ali must go. Mubarak must go. But originally, his original statements were, this man is a friend of the United States. There's other ways here. There are things we could do. And then suddenly when it was like, oh shit, well, this, he's out. Then he came, you know, shaking the fist. That's and right. I feel like that's what's going on now with the South and South and South. Right, except that it's not clear he's going to go, and right. so we haven't made clear that we're against him yet. So. Well, it's, it's probably getting about time to close things up, unless anyone has something in their chest that's making their heart beat better. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm Iranian. Um, I sympathize a lot with uh, what our first speaker said about Iran and their good intention of making bridges between the two countries on different levels. But um, I also want to somehow and somewhat sympathize in a kind of similar way with our perhaps Syrian friend, Shashan. Yes, sure. um, yeah, not in the way that he presented himself on, on, on his thought on Syria, but the distrust between, I mean, among um, Iranian officials, not Iranian people, is really profound and deep. It cannot dissolve so easily. And I sometimes even tend to think that, this is what many people say, that they need an enemy, conspiracy theory, those kind of things, or different purposes, externally and um, internally, and that would make the situation more complicated, so that building bridges will not be that easy as you think. One thing that you said about, I think you said, um, you use the word um, um, election voice, I think perhaps one was in one you were referring to the Mossadegh time, the other one perhaps the 2009 election, I think in the mindset of the most of Iranian people, at least the 2009 election was fraudulent. If you go to the universities, to the journalists around Iran, I would say more than 90% of the people, the educated and also uneducated, would agree with the fact, would agree with what I, I'm saying as a fact that it was fraudulent. So you are not dealing with a very kind of um, transparent system so that um, all these kind of good um, intentions on your side or on the side of other people who want to build bridges can really translate into good fruits. So there are many um, misconceptions and also problems that need to be solved, of course, primarily by Iranian people themselves, but again, the help of others outside of the country is also needed. Um, and I was wondering um, what you can say about this part of the um, debate between the two presidential, um, our two I mean, uh, American candidates for presidency about um, whether or not Obama should have supported the Green Movement when things broke up. Well, you, you start out saying that it's not going to be that easy to build bridges, and then 
you note another uh, situation that our two cultures have in common. We both have fraudulent elections. You know, we, I mean, we, we, ought to, we ought to be able to build on that together. Um, I, 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 I you think need to live in Iran to know what I mean. I mean, the free media that we're enjoying here is totally incomparable with the situation in Iran. I appreciate Things that, are not perfect, but we're not yes, enjoying are not it. not ideal, yes. but the comparison is totally off the target. The, my, I mean, my position is not that Iran has a great government or that Iran has yeah, a great yeah. set of, of civil liberties and protections, uh, merely that it would not help Iran or us or anyone else to continue threatening war. Yeah. That's all. Um, yeah, that's so right. should Obama have, have supported uh, the opposition in Iran, I, I mean, you have to also ask the question of whether such support would have actually been helpful, yeah. uh, because that's a very complicated uh, yeah. question. Uh, I think to the extent possible, governments ought to stay out of other governments' elections. Um, I wouldn't mind if Israel stayed out of ours. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I think, uh, you know, I think that we as a people and to some extent, as a government, should be supporting nonviolent, positive, civil society building movements around, around the world. Yeah. But supporting a group uh, in an election, uh, as opposed to demanding verifiable elections, uh, is a very uh, difficult question. And we, of course, are, are probably the last nation in the world to have the authority to demand verifiable elections of any other nation when you know Jimmy Carter won't even consider our nation worthy of pretending to verifiable elections um, so it's you know it's it's Scott, it's difficult if I may just have a footnote I recognize the gravity of your question um, it's partly because I recognize the gravity of the question and in my travels around Iran I was fortunate to get to know many different Iranian scholars and figures and people who became activists in various political movements. And I don't usually talk about this publicly, but I was aware of several people that I had had great esteem for and admired and had, had met them and worked with them. And then I became aware of some great suffering that they apparently had endured. And I'm aware of how deep and severe the fault lines are inside Iran and, and appreciate that there's intense anger and fury about what had happened I, I have my own personal views on what happened with the election specifically. I'm aware that there's an intense debate and divide over that, but I, I understand your sense that there's a widespread sense that this was not how to do an election, and this is not how it, the debate should have been resolved afterwards. Be that as it may, then what becomes when you have candidate Romney, in effect, saying that the president didn't stand with the Iranian people, that he missed the chance. I think the president was in a horrendous position at that time. Um, he eventually did start becoming more critical by the fall, but he was, I, I think, making the, you know, we as Americans like to think we're concerned about human rights. But there was, there was a, Professor Ramazani had an op-ed or an essay at the time where he's saying there's a lot of different contending human rights going on here. And we may have our sense that the Iranian people are suffering here and that this is something that we find not worth, I mean, not acceptable even from our, from our standards, from their standards and we recognize the struggle of the Green Wave. But then the question is, uh, what about the human right to life itself? Is figuring out a way to have, when I, when I talk about mutual respect, that doesn't mean having an, an approval, approving what's going on. It's in effect recognizing Iran's independence, that this ultimately is an Iranian problem. And by respecting the Iranians, we're saying, yes, we, we, we ourselves see it. We hear the pain, we hear the cries, we hear the demands for recognizing the complaints of the opposition. And at the same time, we also are insisting, or not insisting, but recognizing your right to resolve this yourselves from within Iran. And it's a delicate balance. It's easy to throw pot shots saying the president should have done more. Well, what exactly more could he have done? And then, then you go into the issue of all the sanctions that have been applied. I'm not aware of any major green opposition figure wanting sanctions. You mentioned Shirin Abadi. She's she herself very critical of the regime, and at the same time saying, please don't be doing sanctions in our name. She and wants to target it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and then you get into that issue of targeted <laughs> sanctions and you know, the so-called smart sanctions, 
And now we have, you know, we've dropped that rhetoric in the, in the, in the heat of the American politics. Everybody's talking about, well, look, look how good we've done. We've, we're crippling the country. Well, okay, it's causing the country great pain. But what was the objective? The objective was to reach a, a way to, to resolve this horrendous nuclear dispute. And were we any closer to getting that? I'm afraid we're even further away from that because of all this application of the pressures. Now, I'm aware, too, of the issue of, well, if we strike a deal with the current system, then various opposition forces might resent that. And yes, that's, again, another debate inside Iran. Um, I, I'm with those, though, stressing, OK, if we believe in that ultimate human right of life, <coughs> the right of life, and we want to avoid war, that's that's. It doesn't mean we ignore those other human rights that we might be concerned about, that might, we might think we might have some standing on, but there is this sense of by avoiding war, then we can give the country itself a way to move forward to resolve this. If we're in a situation where Iran is, feel, you know, the, the metaphor that often gets brought up in Iran is when, you, when you, you're on the ground and a bully has its, is stomping on your neck, and then you say, okay, we think you should, you know, follow our approach to human rights. Um, the, the Iranians have, if I can, Time for one little story, one minute story. Uh, in Ayatollah Khamenei, August 2009, he was trying to explain to the Iranian people um, what negotiations would be, what diplomacy would be. And he brought up the metaphor of the shopkeeper selling a jar of honey. You might remember that. And uh, this was on a national broadcast sermon, but it actually appealed, it was bringing up an old metaphor from Iranian culture. And you have someone who comes in. Um, um, and wants to buy that shop, I'm just going to pull some numbers out of thin air here, and says, um, uh, how much for that jar of, jar of honey? And the shopkeeper says, 100 toma. And the, the bully says, shakes his hand and says, 10 toma. Well, in traditional bizarre class, you have to with an ongoing process of tarot and negotiations and diplomacy. But uh, the, the shopkeeper is saying, uh, OK, 75 toma. And the guy holding his hand is starting to squeeze a little tire says, 10 toma. And the shopkeeper is looking at him, starting to have a little fear in his eyes. What am I dealing with here? Um, and he says, OK, 60 toma. And the guy starts shaking his hand and becomes a death grip on his hand. And he says, how much for that jar of, of honey? And by this time, his hand's turning blue. And he says, OK, 10 toma. <laughs> and everyone recognized that that was not negotiation, that that was an extraordinarily unjust situation. It was, in fact, a bully using his force. And from the Iranian perspective, even though we have severe differences and there's great pain inside Iran, there is still this issue of this nuclear question needs to be resolved and needs to be addressed between nations. And there has to be a way of, in fact, respecting each other as countries and respecting our differences and trying to move forward and resolve what we can. I think that might be it. Thank, thank you guys for talking. That was, that was real good. Thanks for coming. Thank you.